Welcome to Grants Rock Warehouse, and today we are looking at Big Country's 1983 album, The Crossing. This is the first studio album by Scottish rock band Big Country. It was originally released in July of 1983 on Mercury, and it was recorded over a period of one month in May of 1983. The sessions took place at the Manor in Oxfordshire, RAK in London. Our panel tonight, Ryan Gavalier from Ryan's Vinyl Destination, Davey Gallagher from Davey Cinema Flicks and Movie Picks, and Bill Schuster. Bill can be seen on The Contrarians, so please check out all these channels. So without any further ado, let's get to our panel and to Big Country. I've got a little quote here from an American magazine which describes Big Country thus. Guitars that sound like bagpipes, apocalyptic images of fire and brimstone, folky ballads about war-torn lovers, murky rockers about mysterious signs on mountaintops. It goes on to say one album of this Scots combo's trad-inspired rock was plenty. I think the only reason that, that people pick up on the Scotchnesses and stuff is we are, I prefer to, to write from life, as it were, and I live in Scotland and I, I work on, and play amongst people in Scotland. And uh, that's the way, the way that my writing turns out. I think there is a, an, an excitement in the music that doesn't come from, from one individual's input. I think it comes from the uh, what we generate b between the four of us playing together. And I think that excitement carries over through records and through gigs and people can feel it. People can feel that the, the excitement comes from us. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Grants Rock Warehouse, and I want to welcome Ryan Gavalier, Davey Gallagher, and Bill Schuster. You've seen all these gentlemen probably on The Contrarians. Uh, Ryan and Davey have their own channels, and I'll put the links below, and I'll let them promote those at the end. But tonight, we're looking at Big Country, The Crossing. It was re released in 1983 on Mercury. Um they were a very popular Scottish band back in the 80s. The album reached number three in the UK, number four in Canada. Um, in the US, it went to number 18 on the Billboard 200. It did go platinum in the UK and Canada. Uh, the big song on this record was In a Big Country. That was their only US top 40 single. But what a great single it was. We're just going to do a general review and as you know, if you're following this channel, the whole point of this channel is to give some of these albums that are forgotten, that don't give much love, give them some love. So today, I didn't discuss this with the panel, but who would like to go first? I mean, I'm fine with going clockwise. If Ryan, if you want to start us off tonight, that's fine with me. And then we'll go Davey and then Bill and then up to me. So yeah, just a general sure. review what you like about it, what you don't like about it, and your rating. It can be one out of five, zero out of five, out of ten. I don't care. I'm just going to say right off the bat, I probably have the least amount of history with this album and the group. I didn't hear it until maybe like two months ago. Um, so, it's But I want to say, Ryan, that's good because it's nice to have a perspective from someone who wasn't familiar with it. You know, Davey's familiar with it, Bill's familiar with it, I'm familiar with it, but it's nice to get your perspective as someone who has it really. Yeah. So this will be great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just had to put that in there. So, you know, I looked at it and I was like, oh, Steve Lillywhite, you too. Mm -hmm. I love you too. I love Steve Lillywhite with you too. Um, so I was really excited in that front. Um, I looked 1983. I'm like, oh, wow. Same year is literally like one of my all time favorite albums of all time. War. This is going to be amazing. Um, I like this album. But it's no war. I'm going to say that. Uh oh. Um, I think it's really good, though. Mm -hmm. But the production, I have some issues with. For my own ears. I like the guitar sound. I like the sound of the vocal harmonies and stuff. That's all great. Those drums on this album are too much for me. I like some of the songs like Inward where they turn the drums back a little bit. It just sounds like normal drums, not 
quite as much reverb and stuff, but um, on a lot of the songs, it is a little too much for me, the drums. I think it kind of dates the album a lot. Luckily, I will say the songwriting here is great and the performances are great. I mean, these guys could really play. Even the drummer, he can really, really play. I just wish there wasn't so much reverb on those drums because it really, I think, you know, that was a misguided thing of the 80s was putting so much reverb on drums because it dated those albums instantly when they came out. And I mentioned War. These sound like drums. These sound like drums on this album. And this album sounds timeless. This doesn't sound like it was related in 19 I mean recorded in 1983. And I don't really want to compare the two albums too much just cuz they are different bands, they're very different sounds, but it was two Steve Lillywhite projects from 1983. <clears throat> and I did read an interview where Edge said he wished he could write the songs that Big Country did. I don't really get that because I think you two's songwriting is leagues and above. I mean, leagues and bounds above this. I mean, this is good, catchy songs in a big country. Great hooks. They're an excellent chorus. Really cool guitar sound. I mean, I love the use of the Ebo mixed with other guitars as well, like the riffs and stuff. It's a great twin guitar here. I mean, gosh, this is just in general, just such an awesome guitar album. If you take anything from it, it's like, man, they did some really, really cool stuff with the guitars here. And like I said, that song's awesome. It's a great pop track. I mean, it kind of sounds like it could be a lot of 80s bands, honestly, like, but in a very own, but like still kind of unique too. I mean, I kind of hear like a little bit of like, I don't know, some like, uh, what is it? And some of the vocals, kind of like a men at work kind of vibe, honestly. Um, I kind of hear that, which I also like men at work too. Um, but I think this is better, obviously. Um, but yeah, <laughs> there, there it is. is. There you go, Bill's pulling out men at work. Yeah. So Where's that three of hearts album though, Bill? Come on. I'm failing on that one. I stopped after the first two. <laughs> yeah. I, Colin so I really, is also born in Scotland, so same yeah. accent. There you go. Yeah, I I definitely hear some similarities there. I don't really think musically they're super similar. It's just kind of the vocals right. give me some of those vibes mm -hmm. at times. Um, but like I said, that's a classic single there. I mean, I think the drums are too much, but I think it. We just talked about Cut the Clash. I mean, Cut the Crap by oh, the yeah. Clash, an album that is ruined by its production. Mm -hmm. I don't like some of the production choices on here, but I wouldn't say it ruins the album for me. Maybe only brings it down like a couple points for me at most. Cause I do mm -hmm. think it's still a really good album. But I said inwards is a really cool song. You definitely hear more of like an alternative rock kind of feel on this one. Good driving guitar is a great vocal on this one. Um, and like I said, the drums are a bit more toned back on this. Just really good, catchy kind of like, I guess sort of post punky new wavy alternative. I don't know what you would call it. Just kind of like all in that mix of things there. I, this one has a bit more of a timeless sound. Um, I thought chance was a pretty good song. Um, definitely doing kind of like a Bruce Springs thingy kind of vocal on that one. I, I felt um, I like that. I mean, I like Bruce Springsteen. Um you did a pretty good version of it too. And it's just a nice moody kind of song. Thousand stars is probably my favorite song on this album though. That's really, really catchy. I love that chorus a ton. Um, great vocals and harmonies and stuff. Awesome guitars on here. I mean, you really hear that Ebo in action on this song. And, you know, I mean, there were some, some bands using this at this point. Um, kind of but not like super prominently i mean it thing only got patented it i think in like 1978 the ebo the ebo first yeah. guy introduced in like 76 um yeah. obviously like edge would use it on unforgettable fire next year i think it would be um 
he would use it quite a bit on that album and there were some other people using it at the point but this was kind of a very different thing especially to the level they use it on this album so i really respect that a lot and i do think it sounds really good too um drums though once again not too big of a fan of those and just overall i think the production's really <clears throat> bright on this which i think is fine i think it's it's appropriate but i would have liked to hear it a bit with a bit more of like a stripped down production um not so much on a song like that or on in a big country because i feel like it's appropriate but on some of the other tracks that are a bit more gritty and stuff or whatever or i would like to hear a bit more of like a early 90s kind of or even like late like mid 80s like you know bands like the smiths and stuff not like quite as huge of a production like mm -hmm. i'd like to hear how this would have sounded with something like that just because i think it could have done well and you could actually pay attention a bit more to the really good songwriting because at times those drums just kind of drown out everything else for me um so yeah storm is a really cool track it's super moody um i like kind of the celtic stuff on this track and then on some of the other ones i actually think that's really cool how they fused it in with um with like i guess pop rock kind of post punky and stuff how they mix that all in and stuff i think it's a really cool fusion of sounds harvest home i do like but that one i think the drums were just a bit too much for me <laughs> on there um just the production as a whole i just i did like the vocals on that one though it was definitely kind of very celtic and unique and stuff and i like that lost patrol is another pretty cool song a bit more rock and moody um i don't know like second half like close action fields of fire i didn't enjoyed it all but i think poro man was my favorite one on side too it's like a seven minute and 51 second song that is kind of moody and epic in their own way it almost feels a little progressive at times i mean these guys could really play their instruments and they go ham and stuff at points I think I could understand what Edge was saying if it was coming to the musicianship. Because I think musically, these guys are probably a lot more talented than you two was in terms of playing their instruments. Um, but I like the songs more with you two, and I like the overall feel of their stuff. Um, uh, so, yeah, like I said, I'm pretty new to this album, so I still need to like let it sink <laughs> in. But that's just kind of my first uh, first impressions of it i've heard it probably about five six times now listen to it quite a bit for this episode but mm -hmm. i'd say as of now it's a good album i like it i'm not overly impressed i don't love it it's just like i think it's a really good album it didn't mm -hmm. change my life though um you know i keep i hate keep having to bring up you too but steve lily light they directly in talked about this band and stuff coming out at the same time i just for me it doesn't have the same weight the same power that u2 does have um maybe i'm looking at this album the wrong wrong way in that regard but just mm -hmm. you know there's obviously kind of relations there um and i just oh, think that u2 came out and did things a lot better um in this time i mean i said war is one of the greatest probably top five album of the 80s this came out the same year and i don't think it's nearly as good so if i was giving this a 10 out of 10 like i don't know i'd probably give this like a 7 out of 10 i like it but i'm just not blown away by it so far i'm gonna listen to it some more and hopefully it'll grow on me more but as of now, I just think it's a good album, and okay. I'm glad I listened to it. Well, let me ask you this. This is a question, and since you're a different generation than I. Had, uh, had you heard, I know you worked in a record store, blah, 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 but had you ever really heard anything or any tracks from that record, or were you familiar with Big Country before we did this episode? I mean, really, have you heard anything at all? I heard the song in a big country, okay. but that's it. Okay. I honestly, 
I never listened to the album because I didn't mm-hmm. like the album cover. I'd seen it before, <laughs> but I just I thought it was tacky, so mm-hmm. I never put it on. But I I like the album. It's okay. Yeah, it's uh I think it's I think the songwriting's interesting. I like the fusion of sounds. Mm-hmm. I think for me it's the dated production that may take keeps it from being like a top notch record for me. It just okay. I feel like it has a little bit of a mental block for me just because it okay. really does sound dated to me, whereas some other albums of that time do have a bit more of a timeless feel. It might be a generational produced thing. by Steve Lily Light. Well, I think that well, we'll get to Davy here in a second. I think it's a typical Steve Lillyway production. If you listen to Marshall Crenshaw Field Day, it's all right in that same wheelhouse. I don't listen to it. When I listen to it, I don't, it doesn't jar me like that, like it's a dated thing. I kind of look at it like, yeah, this is Steve Lillyway. This is what Steve does. This is what we get when we have Steve produce. Yeah. I, I mean, what... but that, I just like it, Ryan, that you have a fresh perspective on it. You're looking at it from a different angle that I'm looking at it, you know? Yeah. I I just hear how he produced like boy and how he produced. um, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say October because that's not the best produced album. I mean, it's all right, but like war and those albums both sound pretty timeless to me. I mean, they sound like they're from the early eighties, but the actual Sonic sound timeless to me, this one, right. When I turned it on, I was like, Ooh, this is, this oh this sounds really really early 80s well i know you um, mentioned well i know you mentioned the smiths i yeah. think if you put on a smiths record i'm just gonna say i think the smiths could have been released yesterday yeah i listened to the yeah. smiths and it, there's nothing on there that dates it or rem like that sounds tiny or rem yeah like, there's no this right this is just 80s excess cheese huge drums mm-hmm. don't even sound like drums like okay it's just not yeah. really my thing production wise but like i said really good songs really cool guitar i like stewart's voice um so seven out of ten all right perfect davy what's your thought on this record um but different as you can imagine well um, yeah but- you're also well, you're in Scotland. That might have something to do with it. Yeah, the um, other thing is the beauty. The, the, the only thing I want to add is because we have you on this panel and you are looking at it from a European perspective, you might be able to shine a different light on it. So why it's nice to have a panel discussion with, you know, people from different areas, you know. Well, so anyway. European, I mean, specifically that Stuart wanted to make a Scottish band. That mm-hmm. was his goal. Mm-hmm. So taking a step further back mm-hmm. um, and I think Ryan's review was spot on, I mean obviously it has to be if it's Ryan's opinion, but his review is spot on from, from someone coming to it fresh in 2022, right. that's perfectly valid, but taking a step back into what, I mean I've known this album for 25-ish years, I mean mm-hmm. they were one of the first bands that I really got into in a massive mm-hmm. way and I was devastated when Stuart died in 2001 um, so Stuart came from the skids um, one of the punk bands of the 70s in the UK. Um, and to go further into the U2 connection, what did U2 cover when they duetted with uh, Green Day? This, this, uh, the Saints Are Coming? Mm-hmm. That's by the Skids. So U2 have always been acolytes of Stuart Adamson and the Skids and by country in, in a strange way. It just goes to show that sometimes... The records that you make, um, no matter how many they sell, you're, you're still kind of chasing someone else's sound sometimes. Um, so Stuart gets fed up with punk. Um, he's, he's made a few records. Um, his last one would be the third one with um, with his kids. Richard Jobson takes over. And Stuart says, I'm sick of doing these um, albums with just the same chords. He's starting to get a reputation with, as being someone who can really play live, really, really play live. And he decides to start completely fresh with a new band. Um, Steve Lillyway comes on board quite late into it because they had to recruit. Um, it was um, him and Bruce Waters and, um, and they had to recruit a rhythm section. So they recruited the exact same rhythm section who played on Pete Townsend's uh, Chinese uh, Cowboys. What's the name? Uh, of it? No, no, no. They were on um, uh, 
Oh shit! Nineteen eighty record. Chinese eyes. Well, yeah, the one came out before Marvel's that. Ass. They're on the one before that. Yeah, so they've been they've been playing with top guys. They've also played in Roger Daltrey's bands and stuff. So like, they're already kind of crack session guys, but they had never been in an actual touring band, um, or or part of a, a real band. If you will, they were someone else's uh, pickup band. Um, so he forms Big Country with specifically the idea in mind. Um, of making a Scottish rock record. Um, he wants to do this as a project. And Steve Lillaway comes on board because he's disenchanted with U2 at the time because he keeps telling Bono and Edge, why don't you do something that sounds remotely Irish instead of just, you know... Mm-hmm. The sound's pretty similar in those first three U2 records, regardless of, you know, whether you love that sound or not. It's a very sparse sound, so it's easier to sound um, quite good with sparsity. It's a lot more difficult to sound good with with um, a bigger production. So Stuart um, wanted to incorporate a much bigger sound, but in a totally new way. Um, And how do you do that in a Scottish way when you're trying to incorporate Scottish folk music and things? Well, he didn't want to go the cliche way and literally tack on bagpipes and do Mullock and Tyre by Paul McCartney and Wings. Um, So it starts incorporating all these weird effects pedals into the sounds that completely change things. And, and the Ebo, as mentioned, um, becomes not just part of the big country sounds, but becomes fundamental to the big country sounds where people go nuts at the gigs when, when it starts to come out. Um, to go on to the record itself, for some reason it came out with so many different variant covers, but this is the nice green one. Um, I love the album cover, actually, but I think it is one that only looks good on vinyl. I think it's one of those ones. Like, it looks good. Excuse me. But, um, it looks kind of good and regal when you see it in the nice, uh, you know, shiny gold. Yeah. But on a CD cover, you know, it kind of loses all that luster. Um, it kind of loses that, that wonderful mystique. Um, the songs themselves, I mean, to kick off with In a Big Country, um, you mentioned it's their biggest hit. Over here it wasn't. Their biggest hit was on the third album. Yeah, we'll come to that. Um, but in the big country, still just a fantastic, fantastic um, mission statement track. Just we mentioned again in the previous episode, the Clash. We are the Clash. That's a bit cheesy having your name. Mm-hmm. But in a big country, doesn't feel that way because they're singing about being in a big, you know, in right. a big country. Dreams will stay with you, like yeah. Uh oh, mm-hmm. he's frozen. <laughs> Copyright in we all go on a- There you are. You're back. Uh, yeah, I think I think we could take him down because I was too similar. There. Um, <laughs> so he's not, not doing a um, proclaimers type um, over the top. Like, and I would walk 500 miles. Um, but he is very much using his accent to come across. And sometimes it sounds a bit marble mouth. And he's, you know, if you hear Stuart talk, he's got the thickest accent you've ever heard. Uh, well, none of these days, obviously, but in a big country, such a fantastic, fantastic opener to, to well, such a seminal record, and it wasn't a hit. That's the strange thing; it wasn't a massive hit initially. Um, it was, it was not even their first choice of single. Um, inwards, um, as Ryan mentioned, it's got a great guitar sound, and you can tell there that's when you're dealing with somebody who's come from something that isn't a folk. Celtic rock band because the guitar parts that him and Bruce are playing together where they're playing the the little intricate um um but it doesn't sound like when you hear twin guitar it's always the same cliche bands that you hear isn't it it's always Lizzie, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden they find a way to do twin guitar leads that sound completely unique and sound completely mm-hmm. big country um, and it's fascinating to watch them on stage because it's like a punky Celtic rock um, version of it, which is just magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Um, and the way to do it on inwards is probably the most, if you wanted a more commercially 80s sound and take away any of the, the, uh, the, the Celtic rock part of it, which would be to destroy the band really, but um, inwards is the kind of sound I think you'd go for to make it more, you know, that would be the more sound that you'd want on, across the record. Um, Chance, um, I think that's that's um, a good comparison um, to Bruce Springsteen and the Ryan gave because um, although yeah it does sound um, different, it's got the same kind of you know downtrodden and, and working man's anthem, you know, and, and the chorus is very oh Lord where did the feeling go? Well, it's, it's very much a, a, a 
poor me kind of song, you know, the working man's blues kind of thing that Bruce at this point, especially this is just after Nebraska by Bruce. So it's very much the kind of thing he would be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, a thousand stars, uh, Ryan said it's his favorite in the album. It isn't mine, but that's not to say I don't absolutely adore it. Um, it's an anthemic track, um, and I sent Ryan a live version of it um, earlier on. Um, it is insane live. Um, when when the crowd get into it and everybody's pole going around and that chorus sits in, and although there's yeah the, the drums that Ryan's talked about, um, yeah okay they're even here, but there's that whole part where the all, all the music drops. And all you get is pretty much Stuart vo Stuart's voice going, "The luck of a thousand stars can't get me out of this. And you can just, oh, it's like even listening with headphones lying in bed. I want to go up and start jumping around the room. It is absolutely brilliant. It's how you, it's how to do post punk without sounding punky, if that makes sense. Because it's got the same kind of, mm. oh, you can hear this is a party. This is absolutely wonderful. Uh, the storm is where Stuart really wants to incorporate the Scottishness, as you can hear. Um, people talk about the kind of bagpipe sound that it gets from the guitars, and that was very much intentional. Um, and the storm's lyrics are literally written about the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, Bonnie Prince Charlie, etc., etc. So it's very much about Scottish history. Um, and again, a very simple chorus. I mean, they're not, a, apart from the big anthemic singles, they aren't always massive on choruses, which I like too. The, you know, let's sometimes the music with the chorus, which I really appreciate. I mean, we get the, um, ah, my James, they didn't have to do this. They didn't have to do this. That's all the chorus is. You know, but it's not about the chorus. It's about that haunting intro and that, that spectral feel. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, you can imagine being at the sidelines of Culloden and seeing the massacre. I mean, it's it's, it's quite something. Um, you know, then you flip over and you you go straight into Harvest Home. Um, now I do have as if as if I couldn't say that Stuart was um, a, a proud Scot himself. Um, how's this for a picture disc? Um, it's literally. Scotland um, as a picture disc, um, which is pretty, pretty nifty. Yeah, cool. so they've cut off England there, um, which, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's literally been cut down to uh, just being Scotland with a uh, kind of railway station at the side there, which is pretty cool. Um, so a bit of an odd picture disc that I picked up along the way. Um, and Harvest Home is on that. Um, I think that's a terrifically fun song, um, which is just upbeat. And you need it if you're listening in one fell swoop, because after the storm, it's a real barn storm rather than storm. Um, and it's got that cool riff, and he's doing, he's doing, this is a more punky guitar style from Stuart, and he's going like, see how the balls are empty, see how they are hungry. Like, it's very much sing-along stuff. Um, and their stuff was designed to be very much sing along as, as I'll go into a wee second. Uh, Lost Patrol's not my favourite track. Um, that's probably my least favourite track um, on the record, but I still think it's gorgeous in a strange, haunting way. It does have a um, a great sound to it. It's got a very um, low, beaten demeanour. It sounds, again, historical. It's one of those tracks, um, you know, that, that seems like when you read the lyrics, it sounds like or it seems like something that could have been written in the 19th century, and that's something that Stuart wanted to do as a lyricist as well. He didn't want to just write punk lyrics, he wanted to write like Burns and he wanted to write like Walter Scott and another great Scott, Robert Louis Stevenson, another great Scottish writers. He wanted to, to do that kind of stuff, um, which was yeah, it's a lofty ambition, but why not aim high or you'll never hit it? Um, close action. <laughs> that's my favourite track on the album um, I absolutely adore Close Action, I think it's just oh, um, it really hits hits me um, where he's singing the um, I'll carry you home with the guards in my eyes it, it's a song about uh, um, again, always having somebody's back and that always gets me anyway, but when he's singing, well, the West to listen, yeah, yeah. Like he's doing it in this kind of whiny voice intentionally because the westerly is the is the wind that blows. Um, so the westerly, he, he literally lets his nasal voice turn into the westerly size, which I think is genius. It's just something that you can write that as a lyric, but to, to do that in the studio is just absolute genius. Um, gorgeous melody. Um, and again, when he just... 
just the sound of Stuart Adamson's voice going into, I will carry you home with the gods. In my... It just brings me every single time. Every single time. Yeah, right to, to my knees. Um, but then, so you need to pick me up. I've had a little bit of a lull here. Field to fire. Wow. What a track. Um, this, this is... Um, this is quite punky as well. This sounds like it could have been a later skits one where he's going between the father and the son. Da, na, 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 na. So all the all the riffs match what he's singing vocally, which is fantastic. And then it's 400 miles until you smile. 400 miles drop on fields of fire. And just everything hits in all at once. Absolutely brilliant. Insane live. Another, another live belter. One designed for the, we'll come again. We'll come to the battle lines in a second. But then we've already had the storm closing side one. What do you close side two with? Potterman. It, it's everything the storm was amplified, but yet turned down at the same time. If that makes sense, um, it is an epic, but it's as Ryan said, progressive without being prog. Um, it takes their sound. It takes Celtic rocks. Um, ethos, which wasn't really a thing at the time, people are going to forget that, but it wasn't really a thing at the time. But there were bands like Run Rig and, and the likes, um, and it stretches it out for a good two or three minutes before Stuart's vocals comes in. Um, and frankly, it worked so well as an instrumental, I almost sometimes forget Stuart's about to start singing. I think the music's just so gorgeous on part of the end, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, I mean, when he's singing, um. You know, night hangs in the city like a blanket on a cage. I mean, it's it, it, he's coming up with this wonderfully, uh, not street poet, but just folk poet almost. You know, it does sound old-timey. Old and this is a guy who a couple of years earlier was out there playing with the skids, doing just punk music, like just punk music, but like unable to escape that kind of banner. And it's just fascinating that he always had had this kind of music in him. But I think for Ryan, and again, I mentioned that I liked to him earlier, um, to a live track, the best way to hear Big Country at this era is on the CD-DVD set live at the Battlelands in Glasgow. Um, this is the New Year's Eve concert um, where um, they, they do the whole album live, so it's the end of the first tour, um, and they do the EP, the Wonderland EP live, um, mm. as well as a great cover of Smokey Robinson's Tracks and My Tears. Um, but this is the famous gig where at the stroke of midnight, papers come out and Steve Lillaway produced, uh, produced. <laughs> he proposed to Kirsten McCall at the stroke of midnight at this very gig. So you can see the exact moment what was happening where, when uh, Steve Lillaway proposed to Kirsten McCall um, at this, hmm. this very concert when he was backstage. So, yeah, and this is... You get to see them. You saw the energy on the video, Ryan. You get to see them for about an hour and 25 minutes, sweating buckets at the Battlelands, which is just a phenomenal venue. Everybody's jumping up and down. Even though they're a new band, everybody knows every word, every single word. That's how fast they call on in Scotland. Um, hmm. And, yeah, and to follow to follow right through, I mean, they kept releasing these these albums through the, the 80s and 90s, and sometimes they were better than others. I mean, there's the Buffalo Skinners era and you know, Why the Long Face. Um, they took a hiatus, and Stuart formed a country band in Nashville, the Raphaels, and it would be the last thing he ever recorded before he killed himself, sadly. Um, but to me, this initial album, this, this, this one, this one album, is one of my favorite records of all time. And I'm not going to pretend that I can escape the nostalgia of just, oh yeah, it's great to hear a Scottish band doing this. And it's great to see them on stage doing this kind of stuff. And and when Stuart talks in the interviews, he's so thick that they have to subtitle him and things. It's, you know, it's like, yes, he's not turning it down. He's not apologizing, which is what Steve, Steve Lillowhite had the major problem with U2 for. They were almost apologetic about being Irish. Um, so Stuart is very much the opposite when it comes to Scotland. He's very much, no, no, this is exactly what we are. In fact, we're going to make a picture disc of Scotland just to show how, how much our sound is influenced by our country. So although it's very easy to just 
lumped them in as another kind of U2 band. And they did play together and they were friends and, and they, they shared a big circle and, and, and whatnot. Um, but to me, it's two bands with two very different dynamics and two very different mm -hmm. goals. Um, and their third album, The Seer, um, shows just how much Steve Lillaway isn't responsible because that's produced by um, Robin... Oh, Robin, what's his name that did all the, the like Shadays early recordings? Robin Miller, I want to say, something like that. Mm -hmm. He produces the third album, The Seer, um, and Kate Bush, Dave, yeah, she's on that. She's on that one. Sorry. She's on that. Um, and it sounds like Big Country. So a lot of this is Stuart Adamson and Big Country's sound. It's not a Steve Lillaway production. It's what they intended. Yeah, does some of it sound incredible 80s? It's impossible for me to have the same perspective as Ryan because when I heard it, um, to date myself a wee bit, the 80s weren't that long ago. It was only about eight years earlier um, for the first time. So, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to hear the drums quite as badly. I mean, I think Mark Berzecki is a, a brilliant drummer, but again, trying to hear it through fresh years after so long with such nostalgia, love, admiration, and, and feeling it in your soul, oh, I can't do it. <laughs> I, I can't take that out. Um, and to me, it's it's almost, I can't say it's a 10 out of 10 record because that seems like I'm evaluating it as a, a as a, an album. It feels like it just needs to be called perfect because it will be and always will be for me. And that must be a 10 out of 10. But to me, it's almost above a rating scale because it's in that oh pantheon of albums. That, it's in the pantheon of albums that are in my heart. And if I hear imperfections mentioned by other people, I can't hear them in my own head because I'm just so used to it. And I'm not saying those opinions aren't valid in the slightest, believe me. I'm, Brian knows his onions better than anybody. I trust his opinion implicitly. But to me, um, it's just so above criticism. It's like my favourite albums by the band and Bruce Springsteen and Neil Young and Bob Dylan where I can't hear the criticisms because I'm just, it's all so, so, it's like someone criticising your kids or something, you kind of give them yeah. a pass. So, 10 out of 10, Stone Cold Masterpiece. I adore The Crossing and I miss Stuart Adamson greatly. So, yeah. Well, you're very close to this record. I'll give you that. I, I, you know, Ryan, I know he's mentioned the production aspect of it. And I know, Davey, it doesn't bother you. I don't, as far as 80s productions go, and Bill, we'll get to you in a second. Sorry. I don't have the same concerns as Ryan does. I know it is a bit. Well, it's not quite as out there as some records, you know? And I think, I think the crossing is probably aged better than most. I mean, they're all different productions. Nothing's really aged as well as the Smiths. The Smiths are, I mean, that's timeless, you know? Um, but and again, yeah. achieving, achieving such a different goal that it's just right. impossible, you know? Yeah. I just think for me, I hear those huge drum. And what I hear, I just think Steve Lillywhite. That's what I think. That's all I think. Yeah. Because it's not that gated drum sound so much like, well, maybe it is. It's not the whole Phil Collins thing, which really sounds dated. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is kind of there, but not totally. It's almost there for me. Well, Right. Not well, not quite as bad. All right, I, Davey. I <laughs> well, thanks for your review. That was great. Bill Schuster, I want to welcome Bill to the uh, channel. I don't think I haven't had Bill not, on here yet. Not yet. We've been on contrarians together, but yeah. not on the same on my channel. So welcome. What is your thoughts on the uh, the crossing? Well, I I have a 39 year history with this album. I was 15 when it came out. And my original copy was a cassette. So mm -hmm. I was missing some of the information. I don't recall if the lyrics were included or not in the cassette because my cassette copy, unfortunately, mm -hmm. disappeared into the mists of time long ago. And this vinyl copy I've had for less than a year. I just wanted a, a physical replacement. I wanted to get the actual record. And so this is the first time I've been able to really check out the lyric sheets and the interior artwork, which was pretty cool after decades um, unfortunately, the first time I put it on, I hear that iconic 
do, 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 and the next thing you know, it's do, 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 skip. That was painful. <laughs> throughout in a big country, there were multiple skips. And uh, also throughout inwards, there were a few. After that, everything plays great. But I was a little heartbroken there for when I first discovered you sure that. that wasn't just your one. Ha! I'm doing one of his. Ha! <laughs> Maybe he was too intense for my uh, setup here. <laughs> <laughs> um no. regarding uh ryan's uh view yeah it is interesting to hear a different perspective uh generationally with me not only uh do i not mind the 80s i don't see the 80s production as perjurative at all i see it as a positive because i have much as davy spoke about uh he's unable to separate himself nostalgia wise and how important this album is uh for me it's that era that uh, early 80s era especially 1983 is a special year for me so i love the sounds of the things that came out there and i like the fact that some of that is dated because it takes me to that place in time it takes me back to being that wide-eyed and wide-eared young teenager who was so excited about all this music that i was discovering at that time so yeah, totally different perspective for me on this. Um, I love that drum sound. I wouldn't want it to be on everything. I think objectively, uh, the 70s are by far the best decade for overall music. But subjectively, the 80s are here. The 80s are near and dear to me, especially the early 80s. As we go on later into the 80s, I start getting a little more critical of the uh, sounds, definitely. But in this era... Mm, perfect. Love it. Um, I first heard in a big country, like probably most people in the States, that was the first thing we heard here, listening to Casey Kasem and his uh, Top 40 Countdown. I seem to recall it only getting to number 30 on the charts, but apparently I was wrong. It got to number 17 here in the States. It was apparently uh, a bigger hit in Canada and New Zealand. Um Really, after this, the only time I... There are two times I remember hearing Big Country on the radio after this. That would be when Wonderland was first released. I saw the video a couple times, and then it was gone. Never again. And later on, uh, when Peace in Our Time came out, the song King of Emotion, were produced by Peter Wolf, their uh, attempted pop comeback, as it's been called, uh, King of Emotion got a fair amount of radio play, but apparently it wasn't actually a hit. I seem to recall it being a hit, but, well, memory is apparently a failure sometimes. <laughs> but I love that stuff, too. Not nearly as much as The Crossing, but King of Emotion, I thought, was a great song, at least. Um, the song in a big country, the lyric is wonderful. I love to sing along with it. In fact, yeah, many of these songs are great to sing along with. Every time Davey was singing various lines i automatically was hearing the sounds in my head and was just wanted to start moving so apparently uh, you managed to channel steward enough there davy oh, me... um let's see the songs i have notes on here see which ones actually uh got me the most Chance, I didn't realize until doing a little further research on this that Chance was actually a hit outside of the States. That's just uh, my ugly Americanness apparently being ignorant of uh, how well some of these other songs did outside my little corner of the world. Uh, the lyrics on this are simultaneously brutal and beautiful. The lyrics on Chance, it's heartbreaking. It's uh Essentially, the tale of a woman who finds uh, a man who uh, gets her pregnant. They have children, and then it turns out that the guy decides to leave, and she's left alone and wondering what happened to her life. What is happening? <laughs> oh, Sorry, I didn't even notice. That's oh, it's that's Bill. 
I was so intent on continuing to talk about Chance, I didn't even notice Duke. Well, sometimes. I know, yeah. but you were talking about Chance. I'm going to interrupt because, well, of course, this is a perfect time to interrupt. But I think the melody on Chance, the production on it, I love that. I think I might lo- that might be my favorite track on the whole record. I think that song's just absolutely stunning. Yeah, Stewart's vocals on that, I love that track. Highest but, chart and single in the UK as well. Was it okay? And it should have been. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Anyway, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I would agree. I think that I'm too close to the song in the big country for anything other than that to be my favorite. But Chance is right there. And it's a whole different animal than in a big country. So I can have two one A's here for different reasons. Um, The Storm... I had not known it was about the Jacobite Rebellion Rebellion until I did further research on this. I thought it was just something that Stewart had uh, made up, uh, a historical fantasy perhaps. So it was pretty interesting to find out the actual historical basis for the song. I've always loved the song, the sound of the song, the opening, the Ebo, the ghostly female vocals. Um Speaking of, Duke is trying to reproduce some of those vocals. <laughs> One of these times, I just need doing to doing a great Duke. job. <laughs> nice job, Duke. Um, yeah, I believe uh, Christine Beveridge. Yeah, that's does the female vocals on this, and they are absolutely haunting at the beginning of the storm. They work great with those Ebo sounds. Uh, this was one of those songs that I just used to love to listen to in the dark i'd put the tape in before i went to bed and just get carried away in the sound of this song into this other world of course then i had to flip the tape because well 80s technology what are you gonna do um flip the tape there you go exactly (laughs) uh poor old man that was another one that i did a little research on i i wondered all these years what is a poor old man i still don't have a definitive answer but a couple things I found. Apparently, there was an H.G. Wells story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've read plenty of H.G. Wells in my younger days, but I don't recall that one. Um, there were also comments about it uh, being about some sort of witch doctor was the uh, phrase that kept popping up. So that put an interesting spin on some of the lyrics here that I never had before. Uh some of the other songs that Ryan and Davey picked as favorites are, uh, which shows the nice value and variety of this album. Some of their favorites are some of my least favorites, but that's not to say they're bad at all. Cause I like every song in this album. There are no bad songs here to my ears. Uh, but some of those say inwards, Harvest Home, Close Action, A Thousand Stars, sometimes while I enjoy every one of those songs, they don't grab me in the way that some of the ones that I've already mentioned do. I wouldn't call them filler by any stretch of the imagination. They just don't reach me in quite the same level. Yeah. Um, I have noticed, Davey had mentioned about the choruses. I'd also written a note about that. And uh, I'd commented that uh, they fail the Bob Seger rule, where Bob Seger had famously said something along the lines of, if you want to have a hit song, say the song title in the chorus over and over and over. And it will be an earworm that will catch people's uh, memory. And they absolutely do not do that. That, oh, that my Bob. James, you didn't have to do, that, d- do this. I didn't know until recently who James was. I had no idea who Stuart was singing to or about. Sounded great, but what does this have to do with the song title, The Storm? What, uh, it works great here, but yeah, absolutely. The Bob Seger rule has not been followed. Perhaps if they had uh, followed the Bob Seger rules, who knows? I didn't even know there was Maybe a Bob was- Seger rule. I'm learning so much tonight. <laughs> Bob Moo, just listen to your Bob Seger, and you'll he likes to repeat those chorus yeah. lines over and over, those song titles. Yeah. Made more hits um, than he did over here, so I'll follow the Stuart Adamson rule. <laughs> that <one>. That's right. 
salad. <laughs> um, Oops. I had also, uh, I'd forgotten. This was after the crossing, of course, but my favorite Pete Townsend album. Point uh, City. Tony yeah. and Mark were the rhythm section on this album. I'd yeah. completely forgotten about that. And I had forgotten or not realized that, yeah, Tony had also played on Let My Love Open the Door and on the interim pretender single back on the chain gang, which I actually bought the 45 of when it came yeah, out. I did too. No credits there. So yeah, that's uh, cool to see how these guys were a little bit of here, there and everywhere. That happened a lot in that era though. Um, I've got to say as much as I enjoy this album, um, I do wonder if maybe big country is a bit of a one album band for me while I enjoy their other albums. I don't think that any of them hit me on this level. So, uh, and I'm okay with that. There are some artists like that, that, okay, this might be all I need while I can take little side trips from time to time. If I just need that fix, when I play this album from start to finish, I'm probably good for a while. So I've played it from start to finish quite a few times this week. So, mm-hmm. as I'm sure we all do typically when doing these sorts of things, prep work. Uh, if I had to rate it, um, just because of how big 1983 for me is as a year and what I'm comparing it to. I'm going to give it about an eight. I don't want to go much higher because there's so many albums I love in this year that I, I can't separate from the nostalgia again, but it's a strong eight. It's uh, not saying at all that it's a weak album because it's a wonderful right. album. Yeah, I totally get that. Like as far as 83 goes, there are some more albums that I like better than this record, but I don't think there's a weak track on this. Um, the production doesn't bother me. I just, you know, like I said, it's Steve Lily White. I just accept it. You know, the songs are so good on it. You know, you look at the clash, cut the crap. There's it's got bad production and sketchy songs. Um, cause we were talking about that before, but this record, the songwriting's just top notch. And I think based on, well, they're trying to sound Scottish and it's, trying to be i don't want to use the term bombastic it's kind of bombastic but it's not i don't know it's hard to put my finger on it but every time i hear any of these tracks i don't want to turn it off it doesn't bother me at all um if i was going to give it a rating but there are i probably give it a crap I would give it a three out of five or maybe an eight out of 10. I think, I think it's a classic album. The thing with big, big country, we look back at big country years from now and remember them. Did they have that kind of impact? I mean, in Scotland or over in the UK, I don't know. Davey could probably answer that, but will we remember big country? My, you look at Duran Duran now. Duran Duran, when I remember going to see them, Seven in the Rage Tiger Tour, the whole concert, all there were were girls screaming for them. They weren't taken seriously. I think Big Country was taken way more seriously than Duran Duran, but look at Duran Duran now. I love Duran Duran. Rock Hall, (laughs) they're still going. They're still together. If I would have looked at them in like 1985, 83, would I have thought Duran Duran would have kept going? I would not. You know, I was into Duran Duran. I loved them. And I love big country too, but I don't think big country was able to sustain that magic that they had on the first album. I mean, we may even look into the catalog some more and talk about it, but I think that first album was perfect. It was perfect for the time. And to listen to it now it it really doesn't bother me at all i mean i must say at the time when it came out i mean i liked all the 45s i was i wasn't all into the record though there were like i said there were other records i liked better but now listening to it i just think it's absolutely wonderful 
to be quite honest. Compared to a lot of crap that's out there now, I think it's a great record. Um, and I hope exactly by us doing this series, I know Davey's got to go here shortly, but by doing this series, my goal, and I've talked about this before, is to turn people on to some of these records that might have been forgotten and shoved aside you know, everyone will look at Duran Duran Rio and go, oh, yeah, that's a great record. But The Crossing by Big Country, maybe not, but maybe we can get it out there and some people may pick up on it and get turned on by it. That's what I'm hoping. I think it's a great record. I think if you've got a, a record collection, you should have that in your collection as far as representing the 80s or whatever, representing Scotland, for Christ's sakes, or good songwriting. Or a good example of a Steve Willily White production. I think everyone should have this record in their collection. So hopefully we can turn on some people to this record. And I don't know. We'll see. Well, like I'm I turned see, on. Man. Well, Davey, you're always turned on whenever I talk. <laughs> That's what I like about you. But <clears throat> so I'd say everyone gave it a favorable review, a seven or an eight, right? That's a great review. And but, 493 or whatever the fuck I give it. Yeah. Well, that's right. Even Davey kind of, well, over the top. But that's what we expect. <laughs> but anyway, I know Davey's got to go. Let's wrap this dog up. I appreciate Ryan Gavalier, Davey Gallagher. Bill, I was just going to mention your name, then I blanked out on your last name. <laughs> Schuster. Schuster. I the got world it. famous Bill Schuster. That's or at right. least famous. In I was going there. on one of my rants and I got sidetracked. Bill Schuster, we you will see Bill on this channel more often. I want to thank Bill for coming on, and this is his maiden voyage, so to speak. Uh, but anyway, funny. everyone, please like, subscribe, make a comment. If you like this record, let us know. Share this. Let's get the big country out there. In fact, I'll talk about we may look at another big country record too. I don't know. There's a lot more to look at. So, oh, yes. There you go. So, anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming on. Gentlemen, I appreciate it. I will put a link in the comments. You can watch this whole concert on YouTube. This whole concert is on there. So, I will All stick right. this in the comments. Folks, if you don't eat, like the records, give them a chance live and they will blow you away. There you go. All right behalf of Grants Rock Warehouse, I would wish everyone a good night. Mm -hmm.